Now, th are you getting all that in the shot, or is that? I am, yeah. Okay. And I can crop that. That's amazing. I like it. I think you're good to go. Today, you can be at home in the fellowship of the Father as we learn the secret of the easy yoke, how to effortlessly do whatever Jesus would do if he were in my place by arranging your life around those activities that Jesus practiced to be constantly at home with the Father. And I'm reminded of the word home right now because I'm at home. This is the cabana where Nance and I live, and it's a place of safety and a place where we love looking out at the beauty outside of it. And it kind of feels cool to have you here at home together with me. And we're going to talk about these different practices. This is the first one today. We're going to talk about solitude. But before we do that, I want to mention one word about the two different categories of spiritual practices. This may actually help you decide which practices will be most helpful to you. So Dallas Willard in the Spirit of the Disciplines divides practices up into two different categories. There are disciplines or practices of abstinence where I abstain from doing something that I would normally do. I don't do certain things. And then disciplines of engagement where I do certain things like study or worship or celebration or so on. So practices of abstinence where I don't and engagement where I do. There actually is a connection here between, as you may know, Historically, sins have been put into two general categories. Sins of commission, where I do something that's wrong. I lie, cheat, steal, kill. Or sins of omission, where I just don't do something. Lovelessness, joylessness. Those are the more respectable sins that those of us who have been around churches for a long time usually learn to be quite expert at because you don't get in as much trouble for them. Now, as a general rule, if I wrestle with a sin of omission, like joylessness, then a discipline of engagement will help because with omission, it's my do muscle that's too weak. And so when I engage, I strengthen that do muscle. So the practice of celebration can help me overcome joylessness. On the other hand, if I wrestle with a sin of commission where I'm doing something that I should not do, let's say I gossip, do you ever do that? Then a practice of abstinence where I'm strengthening my don't muscle like maybe silence, can help me. So those two basic categories will start with disciplines of abstinence where you don't do things that you normally would. One of the important reasons for this is most of us find that our lives are way too cluttered. And if somebody tells me, you got to start doing more stuff, it just feels overwhelming because I already know I don't do nearly what I should be doing. So we'll start by um, taking stuff out of your life, just things that you don't have to do, removing things so that there can be freedom and space. And uh, perhaps the most fundamental of all the practices of abstinence is solitude. Here's, here's what it is. Again, every day I'll talk about uh, definition, what this practice is, and then why do you do it? And then uh, a few words about how you can do this today. So in solitude, we purposefully abstain from interaction with other human beings, denying ourselves companionship and all that comes from our conscious interaction with others. We close ourselves away. We go to the ocean, to the desert, the wilderness, or to the anonymity of the urban crowd. This is not just rest or refreshment from nature though that too can contribute to our spiritual well-being. Solitude is choosing to be alone and to dwell on our experience of isolation from other people. Solitude frees us. Now, this is the why. Why should I do um, solitude? Why, why would I want to go and be alone like that? For many of us, aloneness is really painful. The spiritual disciplines are always about freedom. That's true of disciplines in general. The reason that you practice scales is so you'll be free to make great music in the moment. And the reason that we practice spiritual disciplines is always so that I will have the freedom and the power to do what needs to be done in the right way at the right moment. The disciplined person is not the person that practices a lot of disciplines. The disciplined person is the one who's able to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. And that's the goal. So now in solitude, uh, uh, I go away from other people 
And the reason this is so powerful is there's just patterns of interaction. What do you expect of me? What are you looking for from me? How do I try to please you or deal with you? Or how do I get from you what I want to get from you? And all of those things lock us into certain patterns of thought and behavior that we cannot get out of when I'm with another person. Right now, I'm with my buddy Tim, and he's helping me video this. But part of what's going on inside me is, I wonder how Tim thinks this is going. And I cannot turn that off. But when I'm alone in the cabana all by myself, and not even Tim is here, then I'm free. That's what solitude does. Dallas writes this, It takes 20 times more amphetamines uh, to kill individual mice than it takes to kill them in groups. Experimenters also find a mouse given no amphetamines at all will be dead within 10 minutes of being placed in the middle of a group on the drug. In groups, they go off like popcorn or firecrackers. I do kind of wonder who in the heck thought about an experiment of treating mice this way. Anyway, Dallas goes on that in our world, we talk a lot about being individuals, but our conformity to social pressure is hardly less remarkable than that of mice. And so if we look in the Bible, for example, at the life of Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, the first thing that he does after being baptized is to go into the desert and the wilderness for 40 days of being alone with his father. And then he's tempted by Satan. I remember hearing a teacher one time say, isn't it amazing that after 40 days in the wilderness, solitude and fasting and so on, that Jesus was able to withstand the temptations no, no, no. The wilderness is in the, the place of strength. When he had spent 40 days of solitude and prayer and fasting, he was not in a position of great weakness. He was at a point of greatest strength. And that's what we so don't often understand. So how do I go about practicing solitude? Well, when I first started to learn about this, I thought, all right, I want to take the next free day that I have and go spend it in solitude. So I waited. You want to guess how long I waited for a free day to pop up on my calendar? didn't happen. So I realized I'll have to make a commitment to do this. I'll need to get my calendar out. You might start thinking about this now and set aside whatever that time will, will be. And then I picked a place to go and I picked some things to pray for and I began to pray. And I had the whole day set apart, but I was all done praying in 20 minutes. And I thought, this is going to be really boring. I've run out of things to say and God's not saying anything. I don't know what to do. So here's a real important uh, aspect of solitude. It's a practice of abstinence. That means the main thing about solitude isn't what you do, it's what you don't do. You don't engage in conversation. You don't engage in stimulation. You're not around other people. And then I begin to discover what's going on in my mind. I ended up not knowing what else to do, just going down by the ocean and just looking at the water and looking at the birds fly. And then eventually thoughts began to come like, you know, every creature was made by God. And uh, I saw dolphins and they love to swim and birds love to fly. And God created me in a certain way. Certain thoughts will begin to come to you. I began to experience freedom. I realized, you know, I can so easily get captivated by how do people think I'm doing my job? And how are people evaluating my life? And when I go to be alone, I can feel in my body this sense of freedom from that. Now, it doesn't matter. Practices like solitude are self-validating. That is, I find that I like my life better when I practice solitude than when I don't because it gives me more freedom from those things that oppress me. Now, don't try to be heroic in this. Today, just uh, take some moments of mini solitude. And uh, when you're alone, like right now, you might just reflect on that experience and recognize that God is here. If you're an extrovert, solitude will be much harder for you. It does not mean that you are less spiritual. My wife is an extrovert. She has never had an unexpressed thought or feeling. Um, it's much more attractive and inviting for me to go into solitude than it is for her. On the other hand, it's much easier for her to love people, which is really kind of the core of the thing. So for me to congratulate myself on my spirituality because I like solitude more would be pretty asinine. Um, sometimes people who are extroverts will say, you know, I want to uh, bring along books and TED Talks to listen to and songs that I can experience. No, 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 that's not solitude. In solitude, I get away from all of the external scaffolding of life to be alone with God. And uh, Nancy will say sometimes, I wouldn't mind solitude if I could just bring some other people along with it. 
Now, be very experimental in this. Be very prayerful in this. When I first went there, I had this kind of romantic picture of, I will have these profound, long, deep interactions with God. It doesn't work that way because when I go into solitude, I'm bringing me with my own mind. And my mind doesn't become magically different in those moments. So it wanders all over the place. And I found myself with all kinds of fantasies about being successful or fantasies about being angry and getting even with somebody. And instead of thinking those are interruptions in my uh, time with God, I had to learn, actually, if my mind keeps wandering to something, probably that's precisely the thing I need to talk with God about. So that's what the practice of solitude is why we engage in it to experience freedom from the pressure of other people and how you can just have some moments today of uh, miniature solitude, times when you are alone and you invite God to be with you. And then you just notice what's going on in my mind, what's going on in my body. God, when I'm alone, could I be at home with you today? Welcome home. Hey, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New. We hope that these videos help you to grow spiritually one day at a time. If you want to access our whole library of videos, or if you want to subscribe to the daily emails or text messages that go along with each video, head on over to becomenew.com and you can let us know there. We're also preparing some exclusive leadership content. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash leadership. And lastly, if you've got a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. You can let us know by texting it to 855-888-0444. See you next time.